uh, we'll, we'll uh, begin with this, this panel in the traditional way. With uh, going to ask each of you to uh, introduce yourselves. So who you are, where you're from, what you do, uh, if you're at a company, what you do, if you're a student here or a graduate here, um, what, you're, what you're involved in. And um, can each of you give a little bit of uh, background to your involvement in the blockchain or crypto space? Um, start with you, Joan. Work this way. So. Sure. So I'm Joseph Kelly. I'm uh, an entrepreneur here in Austin. I've been here about 10 years. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Unchained Capital. We provide loans in U.S. dollars to individuals and businesses who provide cryptocurrency as collateral. So if you're sitting on a bunch of Bitcoin, don't want to sell it, but need some cash, uh, you can use that as collateral with us and we'll send you some financing. Um, so yeah, been, been doing that for about two years and we've had some experience, uh, mostly positive, of, of hiring interns at, at UT. Happy to talk about it. I'm Anthony Sintaga. I'm a second year MBA. I worked with Joe at Unchained in a business development role this summer. Um, my background is actually in the paper industry, so I worked um, making and selling toilet paper and paper towel for like five years, then came to UT and started the Graduate Blockchain Society with a few other guys, and then uh, was just looking to get into the crypto space and got connected, so um, it was a great experience, really interesting. Uh, my name is Alex Paul Manders. I live in Austin, Texas, so after business school I moved here about eight years ago. Uh, I've been a management consultant for 20 years. I currently work for a firm called Information Services Group, which has about 1,700 global employees. And uh, we are a digital consulting firm uh, by, by trade. And I actively am the global lead for our ISG blockchain now uh, global services line. Um, I do a lot of public presentations, research, et cetera. And uh, I'm happy to say this is of, of the last three months, this is my sixth presentation on blockchain, and I always speak extremely highly of, of you all in the University of Texas uh, because it gets a lot of people out there in the enterprise world motivated and excited about the types of things that are going on at the uh, <coughs> university level. So I'm certainly happy to be here. Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Orwick. I'm the current president of the Texas Blockchain Group. I'm also a junior computer science student here. Uh, for the past two years, I've been in the blockchain space here at UT, and I've had the great opportunity to work under Alex at Information Services Group this past summer. And so outside of that, our main efforts at UT have been working to further the blockchain space, along with Anthony and a lot of other people in this room. And so uh, outside of that, just been working a lot to uh, further a lot of the initiatives, and definitely glad to be here. Great, super. So I think we've got a great panel uh, uh, kind, of, kind of looking at this subject from... Uh, from several angles. So uh, we'd, we'd actually like to, the first question, uh, I'm, I'm going to certainly open it up, up for questions, but I'll, I'll get the ball going with, with two or three. So I'd like to just you know, get an understanding from, from each of you. Obviously, you have, you have a different perspective. What your experiences have been, either as an intern or employing interns, um, um, what... Uh, how, how has that experience been? And, and uh, maybe you've got some, an anecdote or two about something that's maybe surprised you about this uh, process that you didn't really think of. Well, we'll start with you, Alan, and work this way. Yeah, so I think one of the main things specifically regarding internships is how different they are from school. And so when you're a student in school, you have a very set routine of, I know what to expect, I know what my project deadlines are, and I know what my semester is pretty much going to look like. And so uh, coming into an internship and really having your first full experience of the real workforce, working with real clients and working with real people, it gives you a very distinct edge on how you want to go out and create goals and have visions for the rest of your career. And so being students uh, at UT and specifically for the blockchain space, uh, the blockchain space isn't very different from a lot of any other internships. It's something you can pick up and it's something that you can find value in and work with and uh, continue to grow your skill set in that one regard. Uh, but as far as typical internships go, not that very different from anything else. And so uh, in terms of just my own experience, it's been very, very beneficial being able to work alongside Alex and seeing what the real workforce is like and even beyond that and have goals that I can aspire to further on. 
Um, so last, uh, what was it actually this past spring, uh, Alan reached out to me uh, by way of social media, which immediately to me was interesting because uh, having students from the universities reach out and, and actually ask me to come speak at the university was very interesting to me because uh, it had never happened. So immediately I knew that, that Alan and, and the others that I had engaged with um, as potential interns at the, at the university were highly motivated. And to me, that was a, that's a big differentiator because I spend a lot of my time uh, working with CEOs, CFOs, CIOs of Fortune 100 clients. And, and it's very difficult to, uh, on occasion, explain to them what blockchain is or why it's important. But when I'm with the students, they're, they're very motivated. And so uh, my, my primary takeaways from, from Alan as an internship over the summer, for example, were that, that as an executive and working with executives, I, I tend to uh, engage with audiences in different ways. And, and then I'm at almost 40 years old working with Alan, who was 19. And, and I felt entirely comfortable taking him into the CEO's office or the CIO's office or the CFO's office. Now, you know, we had, there, there was one occasion, one occasion where I could jokingly say to, to Alan where he, he, he might have gotten bored in a meeting with the CFO and, and shut his computer and started playing on his phone and I had to, you know, certainly say, hey, Happens. you know, let's pour with the CFO, you know. So, uh, you know, so th there were things that I learned uh, just from like a generational or age difference, but hmm. uh, you know, it wasn't anything that we couldn't handle. And, and I enjoyed teaching Alan how to get through airports and live through the Bronx and all these other interesting things that we did, so. Um, yeah, I would say, I would agree with Alan. It's not very different than you know, a typical internship or, or work experience. Um, I definitely came at it from a non-technical side and there's plenty of opportunities um, in the blockchain space to work in marketing, business development, finance, um, which is what I did with Unchained. Um, a lot of the companies in the blockchain space are still startups. So what I really enjoyed was you actually have an impact with the company. Um, I got to work on a lot of high level projects. Um, but there's definitely a need for, for non-technical students in the space as, as well. Yeah, I'd say if any surprises I had was really just um, this is my second startup in Austin, and uh, in the first one, you know, more like eight years ago, we tried to recruit from UT here and there, and with mixed success, uh, there was just there was less focus, kind of entry points to find a bunch of students. But uh, with this experience in la over the last year or two years, uh, there's been a, just a plethora of students that are interested in internships and uh, part-time work opportunities and things like that. So it's been a nice surprise, uh, as I feel like the computer sciences school and other schools have kind of <coughs> just gotten their act together and uh, we, were, we did a, a job fair, the Longhorn Entrepreneurship Association, I believe, did a UT startup job fair and we had like a huge line of just people just talking to our folks at the booth. Um, so it was really nice. We had a, a big fat stack of resumes to pile through, mostly technical candidates, uh, folks that wanted to work at the blockchain related company. So it was pretty cool. Okay. So, so to, to uh, drill down on the subject a bit, um, um, in terms of kind of skills that, uh, or skills, expertise, knowledge that um, are going to be relevant and, and attractive to companies in the, in, in the blockchain and crypto space. If, when you're looking at, in, at bringing on the interns, um, um, what kind of skills do you, you know, uh, are you looking at or expecting? And uh, as uh, from the point of view of being an intern, uh, I think uh, you, uh, you uh, uh, touched on to it, uh, Anthony, that you know, you're not a particularly technical person, you've got more marketing business skills. So I'm wondering how, um, you know, for a subject like blockchain and crypto, which is inherently quite technical, um, whether, you know, uh, what kind of other business skills you can bring to kind of round up and really make a contribution. So uh, be interested to, to know your, your thoughts on that. We'll start with Joe and work this way again. Sure, so I think uh, if, you're, if we're talking kind of you know, non-technical and technical roles, I think across both you want somebody that's self-motivated. Um, one of the things we experience is just when you're bringing on interns, if you're, that there's usually not a lot of management overhead at a startup to kind of go around and like coach somebody or give, you know, prescribe work to them really cleanly. 
Um, so you're looking for somebody that's, that's eager to pick things up and just kind of be more generative in their, in their role as far as finding things to work on. Uh, and then on the, on the technical side, I would also say specifically, we're less concerned with specific skills or experience developing in Solidity or the kind of programming languages around blockchain themselves. Um, we're way more interested in folks that have experience with Git uh, or just even the command line. Um, things like Git are you know, what all the software is developed and how folks collaborate together on a team. So those are skills that really uh, accelerate someone's learning curve once they come into our team, if they know how to work with Git, work with these software development tools that just kind of integrate with our team's workflow. We're not so concerned about the specific knowledge in the domain beyond that, so as long as they can kind of ramp up with the team, it's most important. Yeah, for Unchained, uh, sales experience was, was helpful. I mean, I went from like selling paper goods to selling crypto backed loans, which was, you know, a big learning curve. It's a difference, yeah. <laughs> Um, so that was a big learning curve, but you know you still get a still have to go out, meet people, hop on phone calls. Um, so the skill set didn't really change, and that was useful. And then I did a lot of work on the marketing side, so just making sure um, that you know you have the messaging right and the marketing right. Our team was a lot of developers, so a lot of our messaging was really technical and didn't make a lot of sense to to me. So um, and some of our target customers, so I helped on that side a little bit. Um, so just having a non-technical uh, perspective, I think, was, was pretty helpful for marketing. So um, skills, expertise, and knowledge, I believe, were the, were the primary points mm -hmm. of the question. So I have a, a slightly different background. Um, I'm, while I understand cryptocurrency, I, I am a miner. I've built computers. I've done trading. Uh, but my professional life is very much oriented as a, as a management consultant. And if I think about skills and knowledge, the most important thing to me is, is interpersonal skills. So can I put Alan in front of the CFO? Can I put Alan on a team of individuals, give him a set of tasks and expect him to execute? If within five minutes of a conversation with Alan, I don't believe that he can do that, then he's likely better to do uh, something else as opposed to consulting. Uh, I also look very much into an, an individual's innovative mind. So are you able to effectively craft solutions uh, for clients? We don't, you know, as a, as a consultant, you know, I don't talk with CIOs or CFOs about cryptocurrencies, even though it's, it's very interesting. Uh, we talk more about uh, how do we address supply chain issues? What does your back office function look like? How many financial transactions do you process in an offshore environment? How can we leverage this through your ledger technology to reduce cost and otherwise create differentiating revenue producing IP five to seven years from now? These are the kinds of conversations that, that we have and, and those are the kinds of things that I would expect an intern or a recent graduate from the University of Texas to have. Uh, almost all of my conversations, uh, even yesterday I spoke with people in Spain uh, Dublin, Ireland, and also Australia. And, and these conversations are all around supply chain, uh, and um, a lot of them are very heavy in manufacturing and government. Uh, in fact, after this, I'll be flying to Boston to speak with, or to join a pharmaceutical blockchain, and the, or a supply chain blockchain pharmaceutical uh, conference for the next two days. And that's the, those are the things that that I would look for. So the next intern that reaches out, I'm hopeful has some, some supply chain background uh, in addition to technical and just innovation and entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, so. I think as far as starting with the technical, for an intern and giving my background in CS, whenever you join a project that is so cutting edge and so recently developed, you're gonna be having a wide sense of just uncertainty and where you can take it and what you can do. And especially for this field, I know I previously said blockchain is pretty similar, but it's also very different in terms of documentation, where the field is at as a whole, what the industry looks like, and what's available to com companies and interns. And so uh, combining a whole lot of different projects and workflows, such as IoT and blockchain and supply chain and big data and how that all conglomerates, you're kind of having to figure it out on your own on such a new project. And so for an intern, combining 
all those projects, all those technical skills, and putting it into one cohesive thing can be challenging sometimes. And so being able to face that uncertainty <laughs> and still manage it and have a sense of accomplishment whenever you do finish your project and finish your term period is a very, very cool thing to see. And then on the more kind of interpersonal side, personally going into that, I didn't have a whole lot of, whole lot of consulting experience uh, finishing my sophomore year doing pretty much operating systems and data structures and not a whole lot of other communication stuff. It was very, very cool to see uh, that transition on how a real world role looks like. And yes, uh, being in the CFO's office with my phone out playing Candy Crush and all that might not be as acceptable at the time, but for me that kind of felt like, oh, it's commonplace, I can just kind of hang out. And this isn't some startup, you know, kick back, kick your shoes off. It's, uh, it's a little bit more uh, professional in that sense. So still working on that. But um, outside of that and growing in a role of a consultant and growing in the role of someone that can go out and interface with people, it's really, really cool to see how as an intern I can even give back in such an individual role. Uh, being there at the company for you know, a week at a time, depending on when I was able to make it up there, and being able to interface with their interns and their employees and still come across as someone that they could come to and get advice from was very, very special. And so when Alex would tell me, hey, go give this other software intern of theirs some little guitar souvenir, I was like, why the heck do I need to do that? That, does, that doesn't really do anything for me. But at the same time, being in that role and giving back to them means a whole lot more than it would for me to just come in and just crank out a project, say, here's your results, here's your solution, and then leave. Okay, great. Um, so I guess be be interested to know at this point, um, um, you know, how how uh, from from either of your point of points of view, how how did you go about uh, as an, as a student looking for internship opportunities and assessing the companies out there that seemed interesting to you, and from the point of view of employers, how did you go about finding these interns and and I think you've spoken a little bit about what kind of make what what you were looking for, but it'd be great great to just know a little bit more about that, especially sort of good practical advice for, for anyone looking to go through this process. So um, anyone can take this one. Yeah, I, I guess I'll go ahead and start. And so uh, the way I came across Alex was actually through a referral from someone that was already in Texas blockchain. Uh, he had uh, spoke with Alex previously and had mentioned that they had been collaborating some. And so I actually had the opportunity to reach out to him and learn more about what ISG was doing. And we began to collaborate just on how both Alex and our organization could work together and what we can do to further initiatives at UT as well as just the blockchain space in Austin as a whole. And at the time I was still looking for internships so I was able to strike up a conversation, provide some background on my skill and how I could take part in what ISG is doing. Yeah, and I met Joe through, uh, through a meetup we, we set up at UT, we brought in about 10 to 20 uh, blockchain companies around the area, um, just to introduce them to students in <coughs> our, our club. Um, and it, it, we kind of hit it off and since I interned with them this summer, but um, as far as, as connecting with companies, um, a lot of companies reach out to us for technical roles and you know, I kind of pass those on to Alan. Um, and then the companies that are looking for more business related roles, we share that with, with the students in our club that are interested in FinTech or or blockchain specifically, which is which is a smaller group, but um, usually it's just our, our own outreach and a lot of those companies, or there's a lot of companies in Austin that, that could use interns right now, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean they have to be so technical, mm -hmm. but um, it, it's mainly just been done through our, our student organization. Yeah, and picking off, piggybacking off that some, like even through the Austin Blockchain Collective uh, being, having, you know, referrals through that, just being able to pitch that out to our students and see what their availability looks like and uh, what they're looking for in internships also helps out a lot too. So uh, the market for internships is very hot in Austin, I would say. Uh, and even so, there's more opportunities than there is interns to even fill those roles. And so uh, what we're trying to cultivate is people that can you know, aspire to achieve those roles and go out and already kind of have a mindset of what blockchain looks like and what those roles are uh, kind of skilled for. And so at the same time, I think there's still way more demand than there is uh, people that are there to fill them. Any more thoughts on that? Uh, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think just the thing that helped us most is getting out there, getting on campus, uh, <coughs> meeting folks. It's, um, I'll, yeah, I don't wanna say something and jinx it, but we just had a too easy of a time in the last year, year and a half, I think, finding interns, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So, so are there, uh, are there sort of um, particular, you know, so uh, it sounds like it, it's been, you know, your, your experience has been relatively sort of word of mouth and uh, in some cases a bit more orchestrated by, you know, getting companies to come in. Are, uh, are there other things that you think that you, that could work for you? Are there, are there other processes or mechanisms that you'd like to see that's not happening now that maybe the, the UT could help with or the collective could help with uh, or, your, or your blockchain clubs? So. Yeah, I think, uh, and we talked about it, I know, a little bit last year, but uh, we have about 60 students in our, in our club and a lot of them um, have no background in blockchain or no, under, no, not even a high level baseline understanding of blockchain. They just want to learn a little more. Um, but they're very open to internships and, and working with blockchain companies in the area. So I think if we build a resume book um, or something like that, I know students would be open to, to that. And then, um, you know, you could connect them with awesome blockchain collective companies. Mm -hmm. I think that's a possible way to get more students involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that point. Uh, resume books and directly connecting people with uh, recruiters and people at the companies that they can learn from. If they're an engineer, what does it look like to be an engineer at this company? Uh, doing tech talks and presentations, uh, directly interfacing with students, whether it's in our organizations directly or just put on and presented by organizations, I think that opens up the discussion a lot more. And I know Sledge also had the idea, uh, my vice president's in the crowd as well as our treasurer from the group, uh, to do a conference later on in the year and uh, have a lot more students open to just coming and hearing what blockchain is about and what the uh, companies are working on in the industry. And so um, just interfacing with that and having students kind of more in a less, uh, I'm gonna be in blockchain for the rest of my life, but more of I'm interested in what opportunities are available uh, and make that a little bit easier for them to see, hey, this is not as crazy as everyone's making it. It's pretty simple and I can take part in this and gain a very, very valuable experience uh, without all the hype band uh, distraught that may be kind of already in the back of their mind. Right. So do, do you think there might be a might be a room for some kind of you know a collaboration between the community and UT faculty and students to provide more blockchain education to those people out outside? Of, if, if if you're a technical person, you're probably figuring it out. You're into it uh, out, out of your own motivation, but for people especially on the business side mm. or consulting side, do you think there's a room for providing blockchain education there? Um, very much so. I think the things that UT is currently working on is I mean, very great in terms of cultivating the blockchain ecosystem. There's gonna be a blockchain <coughs> practicum in the spring mm. uh, that is accepting, I believe, 40 students directly interface with uh, blockchain startups in Austin. There's gonna be further graduate courses uh, that Sriam is hosting as well as Jimmy and Carl. Uh, there's going to be another uh, round of the course that we put on this past fall uh, that's introduction to blockchain and cryptocurrency. And so just continuing those efforts, continuing the basic education, the basic uh, gateway into the ecosystem to begin to interface directly with professors like uh, Professor uh, Fercazi over there and uh, Wan Chain and Decred and all these other companies that are in the collective and having them directly go to those people and say, hey, you know, if I'm going to be working with these people, what does it look like now? And so I think these initiatives that we're starting now are great in conferences like this, continuing that effort, getting more students in the door, and just building on it from here. Okay. Yeah, and I would, I would agree with, with uh, Alan, especially on the consulting side. So we as IHG, one of the core parts of our business is that we engage with large technology and service providers. So your HCLs, your Wipros, IBMs, Capgeminis, uh, Emphasis, et cetera large Indian heritage firms that, that are massive players in the technology space. Uh, they, they, are, they reach out to me and ISG uh, often, especially looking for blockchain talent. Uh, we as an organization do a lot of global research on the provider landscape, so we know which providers are strong and which ones are not as strong. Uh, but there is, a, there is a serious glut in the market for blockchain talent, whether it's consulting, technical, or just general business. So if, if you created a, a pipeline or an opportunity for, for someone like myself to just reach out and say, hey, you know, uh, HCL just set up a captive in Puerto Rico and they're looking for two con consultants or full-time <coughs> hires to do blockchain development, you know, that would be extremely helpful. And then also just verifying that the students that wanted to go down that path 
uh, has some sort of just general consulting knowledge or awareness uh, would be really helpful because we, we have lots of opportunities as well and just trying to direct them back to the university in some manner would be great. Okay, great. Um, and jo Joseph, you, in, in the prep for this, uh, one, one thing you brought up is, is that uh, you're kind of wary of, uh, you know, candidates who come to you who kind of, you know, they, they, there's, it's almost like, like they've drunk the blockchain Kool-Aid. They want to decentralize everything. Um, or, they, or, or they want to jump into running smart contracts. And, yet, and what, what's, your, what's your kind of, you know, how, 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 how do you process that and, and talk to them and, and, and yeah. try and get them to add value to what you're doing? Um, so yeah, a couple things on what we use as kind of filters on, on people. I think one is that we definitely would see this trend of people kind of just spitting out the buzzwords or spitting out what they thought sounded cool or they thought that, yeah, decentralizing everything is good, right? Um, and, and it just most often, which I think is okay. I mean, everybody can get into a space because of the blood buzzwords, but it would just usually display a kind of lack of critical thinking or that they actually thought about and internalized these concepts themselves. Um, and I, you know, on, on some of the education material stuff too, I think, I think a lot of blockchain education can result to things like just slide decks or, oh, here's code, here's how this stuff's built, here's how blockchain works and stuff like that. But one huge positive signal for me are anyone that's like had experience with a hardware wallet that maybe owns their own hardware wallet or has sent transactions using hardware wallet. I feel like that's a really key kind of focal point of understanding what this technology, what kind of power it places in the hands of people to submit an uncensored transaction to a public network that then you know, nothing is kind of in between you and transferring value somewhere. Um, but that <coughs> it's just, it really surprised me how many people can come into our office, know a lot about blockchains, th the markets, things like this, but then, oh, what's a hardware wallet or what's a seed phrase or these kind of things. It's, it's on the one hand neat that maybe there's enough layers that people don't have to interact with that stuff. But if you have like that, that means you really get it. Um, only last kind of, uh, anti and anti signal for us are actually um, hackathoners. I think it's kind of not to disparage them. I think it's they're useful and they fulfill a good purpose. But all good uh, engineers that are deep te have deep technical expertise um, have never been a, a hackathon frequenter. Or like any anybody that does really well on the technical side, that I think there's just sometimes a different motivation, different set of motivations that kind of steer people into doing hackathons over and over again or something like that that are just different than like deep technical talent or something like that. So, so one, one way to now parse out our in intern candidates are those that are like uh, repeat hackathoners or something like that versus people that just maybe did it once or don't do it often. Hackathons are brutal, I'll say that. <laughs> so I completely agree with that point. You know, if you can spend a couple weekends doing that, it's more of a community building and getting to know people as opposed to sitting down and building that, a technical solution because you can throw together a good amount of slides and you can throw together a great idea, but in terms of building and testing and production, a hackathon is very hard. And so uh, I think we might have it somewhere in the questions, but that even builds on the further point of whenever you're looking for interns and looking for people to work on things, why opt for the hackathon when you can opt for further bounties and further longer strive uh, project goals that you can do rewards for, whether it's through tokens or direct incentivization. And so, because um, a hackathon is just not gonna turn out the proper result for either a student or for a company on, on both ends. Okay. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? I'm sure we have some pe people who are maybe looking to hire interns or be an intern. Joshua. Well. Yeah. Yeah. All of our interns have been paid. Absolutely. We paid Alan above what we would pay the average intern because of his background with computer science. Yeah, it was a, honestly, it was a great learning experience for me. I got to work in GitHub, um, which I had no experience with before. Um, and then a lot of the meetings and conversations I've had are, are with our developers for, you know, how do we market a product that they're building. Um, so I kind of got to, I mean, specifically for Unchained, I got to dive into 
you know, what our loan operations look like, um, kind of on the back end. And then I, I did a lot of work with, with hardware wallets and, and, um, and even like working with potential partners for hardware wallets. So I, I had a, if you had a good technical understanding of that stuff, but um, with the startup, you're just kind of diving in and it's, it's always gonna be a learning experience and it's kind of a crash course, um, and it, especially for me working with blockchain. But um, for never working with developers before, you know, it, it took a lot of, of me just kind of looking up stuff myself. Yeah, elaborating on that some for a technical student working with people that were, one, not to be rude, but a bit older and not as technical and not knowing what the word blockchain means and trying to sell a solution that encompasses all of that. Uh, being able to kind of just rein in what I know and focus it on what exactly the value add is and what that means for their uh, company in this particular solution uh, and abstracting away all of the technical stuff that I could ramble on and on about uh, was kind of the main challenge that I faced in that role. So, yeah, I, I would say from my own personal experience, you know, as a business guy, like my, my whole background is in finance, uh, but I've worked with software developers and software engineer teams. So with blockchain, you know, I have a very deep understanding of, of what blockchain is to the extent of building cryptocurrency miners with my wife to, you know, these are years ago. So I understand technically how the machines or a node is assembled, how the software landscape works, but then I can apply these things to the enterprise side, uh, but then I can therefore drive conversations with clients. The conversations that I have as a old business guy, according to Alan over here, are um, more practical, right? So when I talk to a CIO, a CFO, uh, directors of strategy, engineering teams, they don't, they don't typically care too much about consensus algorithms or protocols, right? We're, we're trying to uh, identify a technology application that could potentially reduce cost and increase revenue streams in the future. So as a student, uh, it would be really helpful to have an understanding of, of the type of blockchain applications or industries that you would be interested in. Uh, you know, for example, you might like oil and gas, you might like supply chain within oil and gas, you may like pharmaceutical industry, maybe you don't know, but at least having a, a general understanding of the terms is helpful. I would never put someone like you, perhaps that doesn't have a deep technical background like Alan, in, in a position to actually architect a solution. Right, that, that wouldn't be fair. I would simply want you to uh, understand what conceptually we were talking about and then we would find uh, the Allens of the world or the IBMs and the HCLs and the Wipros, all, all the technology providers that I work with, they have the technical skill sets. Uh, they are very good at what they do. And, and so with you, it's just uh, a matter of bridging the gap communication wise, like, like a business translation of language, so to speak. I would trust Preston with the technical stuff. What's that? I would trust him with the technical stuff. Well, okay. I know, I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, I, I certainly would never dissuade anyone from chasing what you're comfortable with doing. Like, if, if you like it, then continue doing it. You know, like, I had never built a computer uh, or a decentralized node for a blockchain. I didn't know what the hell it was. Uh, but we figured it out. But I'm not still building mining computers, right? I still enjoy them. So it's just whatever you're comfortable with, I think, and where you really want to go. Just be creative. I would just add, yeah, I don't think, of course, you don't, you don't need to know how this hashing algorithm works or um, some details about some specific protocol or anything like that, but just sort of like what Anthony was getting at, just that osmosis of, oh, this is how software is developed. This is like how the code gets organized, how versions are managed, and um, this is what an AWS environment means and, and how people manage their infrastructure. And just that, I mean, there's so much of the industry, even if you're in the paper industry by now, like there's software running in there somewhere. There's the, the better teams that are the cutting edge have some kind of technical edge that has to do with software. And so try to find those things that are applicable across industries, not necessarily like you know, how Bitcoin works at some basic fundamental level, perhaps, or something like Spectrum. Annie Moon. 
Envision creating a marketplace for, for job opportunities. So, if a student uh, wants to join a blockchain company, how, how does uh, this person know how many of these 120 companies right. are hiring internship versus full time positions? And so on? We're, we're certainly going to do something. Whether we're going to call it a marketplace or not, I'm not sure. We've begun in very small ways to uh, to expose when companies are just look have got open <laughs> open positions. Um, really very early days with that a lot of companies just even now are not sure what well, uh, not sure whether they are hiring what they're hiring why they're hiring uh, and they don't yet know all the different mechanisms and there are some specialist you know uh, job boards out there some specialist crypto and blockchain job boards so i uh, i sort of don't want to reinvent a wheel but i do want it i do want to make to bring something to the local community to help that um, and very open to ideas for what we should do so if anyone's got them I'm here um, one for you Bill good yeah you would be great in that previous discussion what you had two people of types involved sales tech I'd like to suggest that in a systems talk that, that the companies are probably still in a, in a level called chaos, the other three being com complex, complicated, and, and simple, that perhaps the education or the technology itself is in complicated mode. Is there also a role for the person who just out and out would navigate that? Um, especially in the customer environment, I've noticed uh, a type of job that is, um, I've forgotten what they'll call it, but basically helping the, cust the client through that stage, having that. And uh, so I'm just curious if that is a definite yeah. role. Yeah, so the answer yeah, is, so. is yes. And in fact, I, I forget the exact name for, for the role that you're describing. McKinsey has a name for it. It's like a business translator or a, an internal liaison. Uh, they can communicate to the business leaders about technology and, and then vice versa. Uh, that's what I do a lot of. So when I go talk with clients, you know, I, I've had CFOs literally tell me to put my Bitcoin in my ear, right? But you have to be able to get around that conversation and explain to him <clears throat> what it is that is important to him as a CFO, but then go back to your Allens of the world and, and architect a technical solution and say, build this and you've got, you've got nine weeks. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. So your traditional sales sales person should absolutely have just a general ability to communicate on a very complicated topic because it's not you don't have to get into nodes and networking like you probably know, right? Uh, just working with mm -hmm. with uh, the organizations here. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, I think, just overly com complicated, mm. at least in the market with the people I talk to. It's, it's overly complicated, blockchain, uh, just having that general conversation of what is the value creation opportunity for your firm. And then if, if a technologist goes in and just goes down the rabbit hole about consensus protocols, that co client is confused, and now everybody in their stakeholder leadership team is confused. So, you know, it's, it's just being able to have a, a fundamental clear conversation about the value opportunities. And I think that that can be achieved <coughs> with sales. Uh, and again, it's perhaps even consulting. I don't know if you had anything. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, people are still scared of cloud. <coughs> so uh, communicating blockchain and getting that point across <laughs> takes a very uh, well-versed person. And so uh, knowing what they understand and picking them up from there and explaining that, I think, is a very important skill set and a very important role in any company. I would add from the, the chaos point of view, of like uh, I think a really valuable contribution uh, area that anybody can fill is that this idea of glue. Someone who's a, a glue within an organization finds these little gaps to fill in. Um, something Anthony was just great at excelling at. It's like, oh, that sounds like some that sounds like a project or a small thing. Nobody else has any time for. It. I'm going to do that. Uh, whether it was create a one pager or um, get on a call with a client or a, a potential business development channel kind of a thing. 
Um, so really that kind of glue role can be really critical type of function, I think, in early stages. Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it, the, the glue role. And, and Anthony, if, if you're a good listener, which like you, likely you are, you didn't necessarily have to know the answer all the time because a good sales person or a good consultant says, hey, I will find you that answer, right? So you just need to know where to go and what to listen for. Yeah, and I think for our product, the goal was not necessarily to make our, our customer feel like they needed to ask a bunch of technical questions. Um, I, we really just want to make you know, make it an easy experience, and I think that should be the goal for, for a lot of blockchain companies. Absolutely. One fully final question. Oh, uh, yeah, so um, working on that was pretty f full stack. Uh, being able to pick up a solution and say uh, how to extract data from a pretty physical uh, machine and a <coughs> pretty physical uh, leverage, I guess in a leveraging sense of moving data from both a physical device to a cloud, storing that in a decentralized <coughs> manner, and then having that being able to interface with multiple parties was a pretty full stack effort. Um, and so, again, I don't think many students are going to be subject to that wide range of a spectrum and working with so many interfacing technologies and combining those at once. Uh, you know, even adding external APIs on top of that, such as maps and notifications and things and uh, polishing up UIs, uh, I think that's a very encompassing project, uh, very daunting and very fun to work with. But at the same time, I don't think many students are going to be subject to that wide of a scope. Yeah, and I would say that. You know, anyone interested in learning more about what, what we did over the summer, it's worthwhile talking to Alan. It, essentially, it, it, at a very high level, so I don't know how much time we have. We, uh, we took an elevator. So over here in the hallway is an elevator. Behind those push buttons is a controller or a computer. Effectively, what we did was we digitized the controller within an elevator and then captured all that data through uh, Wi-Fi signals. I can't remember exactly how we tied it Several together. Options. Uh, but we, there, there's a, in, in the elevator industry, there's a problem with uh, repair times and faults that occur within elevators. So if that elevator over there broke and you were trapped in it, uh, it's, the building owner's got to be contacted, the university, the manufacturer, all these things, and it's a very broken ecosystem. And so what we did was we digitized the controller in an elevator to make it an <laughs> IoT smart connected device on the edge in order to effectively integrate with other smart building technologies. Uh, but what we ended up ultimately doing was creating a, an immutable audit log of that elevator. So every fault that occurred, every service claim that were to occur, all the temperature readings, uh, just the whole life of that controller uh, was, is completely digitized and immutable, which is important because elevator parts last a long time. And there's a lot of issues with warranty and repair claims and and client satisfaction. Yeah. And now within this space, you know, these clients can uh, look at Galactic, which is the name of our app, and <coughs> see the history of all the, the faults and, and errors that occurred and repairs. And, and we also streamlined communications. So yeah. layered in on top of, what was it, uh, Hyperledger, Sawtooth, proof of elapsed time protocol, uh, enabled smart messaging, uh, or SMS text messaging and email messaging so that all those communications about any failure in the elevator were captured in an immutable log. Yep. So we broke down a lot of, uh, or we addressed at least five business problems mm. with, with the solution. Uh, even that but he did it all. He, he started in the back end and built the front end dashboard and he even figured out how to tie it to our phones. Right. You've, got, you've got like sure. one, one or two minutes. Yeah, we've got a couple of minutes. Yeah, so the main reason for that is uh, why we opted for the Sawtooth implementation on that end is the management of how that's going to be transferred from owning owner to owner. And so you have issues whenever you run into building management companies, whenever they transfer ownership or technicians and uh, other permissions uh, on how people are interfacing with the elevator directly. 
And so uh, whenever those permissions are kind of up in the air and they're not specifically defined, uh, being able to put that into a smart contract or into a blockchain, which is able to autonomously control how those people are coming in and out of the system, especially over such a long period of time where elevators are up in a building for 90 years and even more to come as elevators are being installed across the United States and China and across the world at a very exponential rate uh, as we're expanding as an urban uh, civilization. And so uh, with that, as kind of that data lake is open to many people to come into the system and uh, take in data and read data and write data, uh, just having that smart contracting capabilities and that interfacing capabilities uh, adds just extra leverage on top of that system. So. Of course, right. thank yeah. you. I think that's uh, uh, just about time. Uh, since uh, this is probably one of the few places in Austin with coffee that you can drink, <laughs> I think we should go, go and try, try and get a cup. Uh, thank cool. you all to the, to the panel. It was a great, great insight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.